What's up, everybody? Just getting this dialed in. Thanks for being here, everybody. Looking forward to diving into this conversation about risk. Um, my friend Cole Christensen is going to jump on in a minute. But I thought I'd just take a brief minute to introduce myself. My name's Z. Hope you guys are all doing well in all your various corners of the world. Um, this conversation just came about when um, Cole reached out to have a conversation. He obviously comes from the world of, um, of surf and I come from the world of the mountains and um, just kind of coming together to connect around the topic of, of risk and, and loss also. Um, about a month ago, I released a, a film called Solving for Z that some of you got to see. Oh, I'm getting an unable to join message. Let me try that again. Okay, give Cole a minute. Um, so I released a film called Solving for Z that was um, all about my journey around risk. Oh, yeah, we found you. Welcome. How you doing, bud? Good, man. How's this? I'm trying to. There, is that better? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That looks good. <laughs> yeah, man. Um, how's things, Cole? Good. Finally connecting. Brothers, yeah, I'm looking forward to the conversation. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, you were just kind of, I just kind of jumped in and you were giving a little background on your, your beautiful film that you, you just put out. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, Solving for Z was just kind of a journey of, um, of wanting to talk about risk in a way that was uh, transparent and honest to, to my own experience. And, you know, I think Cole, something that, you know, we've talked about is risk is what's made our lives rich and um, full of adventure. But um, we've also been around long enough to see the dark side of risk and, and see the loss part of the equation. And I think we both find ourselves, uh, or maybe I'll just speak for me, really, that I find myself in a place where, you know, I've chosen to come back to the mountains and come back to, to re-engage with something that I um, recognize is, is risky, but just brings so much joy to my life at the same time. Yeah, that's, that's kind of why I, I initially reached out to you about a month or so ago after seeing your film. It was, um, you know, seeing your experience and seeing what happened to you um, and then seeing what you went through and then seeing that you had two kids and, and seeing all these parallels between the two sports, two different mediums, two different, you know, action sports or two different things that we do, but in different areas. And, and you use the word selfish and that kind of triggers something in me because I get asked that a lot. Like, are you going to go back? Are you going to go surf big waves again? And, you know, that's one of the questions that, you know, people often ask. And, and I wanted to explore that with you at some point during this conversation. Um, and maybe just for your audience that don't know who I am, I can give a, a brief little background. On, Please. On, um, I'm here in Hawaii. Aloha. And I, um, I'm a surfer. Uh, I grew up, luckily, just happened to be here. And and I, I grew up in the ocean and I've spent some time in the mountains too. That's actually where I met Z. But, um, you know, surfing is kind of my main passion and it's where I express myself and feel most connected. And I had a, um, you know, I've had accidents over the year and I've had friends. Um, I've lost friends, um, like lots of us in, in the mountains and in the ocean. And, and as Z was saying earlier, it's kind of that comes with experience and age and, and dedication. And, and we're, we're doing something that's 
inherently risky. We're putting ourselves in positions of risk, something we don't have control over. So oftentimes things do happen and we can, you know, do things to mitigate that and we'll get into that. But, you know, just, just hearing his story and then telling you a little bit about my story here, um, I had an accident uh, on New Year's Eve last year where I hit my head on the bottom um, at Pipeline and um, I cracked my skull. Um, I got a spider web fracture. I got knocked out and um, I was rescued by a, um, a lifeguard on a jet ski who, who found me facing, floating face down. I was luckily wearing one of those Patagonia impact suits. The ones, I don't know if you've seen those, they're like, they're padded. And um, I was floating, something we, you know, is, is relatively new to our sport. Um, mm. And I was wearing them because we were out on the jet ski towing in earlier and I had my pipeline board and we stopped there. And I caught a wave that wasn't, you know, it was a big day, a pipeline, but it wasn't something like way different than anything I've ever done. It was, it was within the parameters of like my normal sea, I guess. But it was, um, it was a, obviously a, you know, like, threatening wave um, because of what happened. And I pulled in and I, into the barrel, into the tube part of the wave and, and fell. And, and when I hit my head, I, you know, I blacked out. And, and the next thing I remember was being on the beach with the lifeguards, um, with the oxygen mask on, on a flat board. And um, luckily, Andrew had pulled me out and I went straight into Queens Hospital and they cut the skull all off here and they pulled it off and sutured the meningus layer, put it back on with a bunch of plates. So, you know, long story short, I'm super <laughs> lucky to be here and super fortunate for all the steps that happened to, to, to allow me to be sitting here talking to you right now in this moment. Um, and. And then, you know, after that, the recovery and all that. And then, the, you know, just like you, your incident with the avalanche, it's like there's this, you go through some stuff, you know, like a lot of stuff goes through your head that wasn't there before after something like that happens. And then people ask you, people talk to you, oh, are you going to go back? And, um, and then you, you got to have that discussion with them. And, and every time I feel like it changes, you know, day to day, month to month. And as I get further from the accident, I'm, you know, you know, the answer is a little different, but when you said selfish, I, I was like, cause people ask me that. And I, and I've been like struggling with that because that's something for me is like having two kids. And then you start to think, well, is it selfish? Should I go back? But then I have like, I have some like thoughts on it. We can, we can share those. But anyway, that's me. And that's, um, I live in the North shore. I grew up here and, um, yeah, my life is surfing, but I love the mountains too, and I respect everything you guys do in the mountains. And I think there's just so many cool parallels from Malka to Makai, like we said in the post, which means mountains to oceans. And um, I'm just super fortunate to be here talking to Z because I look up to him and what he does in, in that world. So right on, Z, good to finally connect, brother. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Cole. And, you know, I know how many times people, um, you know, say this after an accident, but, you know, I just would say, I'm just so glad you are here. You know, I, I remember so keenly reading the circumstances of your accident and, and really like just interpreting it as a guy who, who really came back from, from death and who got really as close to, you know, leaving his, his body as, uh, as a human can get. Um, and that's, that's just such a that's such a heavy journey. It's such a real journey. Um, I'd I'd love to even just have you follow up for a moment and and tell me like as you stand, you're maybe just over a year out, so a little bit further than me. And yeah. what, you know, what are some of the things that you feel like have changed in your world, or some of the lessons that you're taking and passing on? Yeah. Well, one thing I've realized, and I thought maybe I would like be okay with not going back into the big surf and doing it. But I realized I, I, it, it would be worse. I'd be worse off if I didn't go back. And I, and I feel like I would have, I would feel like I was benched like on a sporting team on the, you know, the, the day of the year. And then the coach pushes you up the bench. Like that's the feelings that I would have. Um, and I thought that maybe, 
you know, initially I thought that maybe, oh, well, I'm going to be okay with not feeling this desire to go back into these big waves or, or do this thing, maybe. But then as I got better physically, as I got, um, spent more time in the water in small waves, you know, I guess somewhat returned to some sort of like normal patterns that were, that are definitely different than before my accident. Um, I can tell you a little bit about that, but I kind of, I spent a lot of time thinking about this, kind of have this theory that, you know, not, not to discredit like what we're doing in this lifetime and what we're eating, but I, I think there's a lot of evidence that supports that we were hunters and gatherers and primarily hunters in our past. And, um, you know, the way our shoulders evolved, the way our feet evolved, the way our stomach shrank, the acidity of our stomach to digest. There, there's lots of different things. We can get into that if we want, but I, I have a strong belief that we were, so hear me out. So I have a strong belief that we were, um, we were hunters and within hunting, it's, hunting's not easy to hunt a seal, to hunt a willing mouth, to hunt a, 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 you know, a buffalo. I mean, it takes preparation. It takes, it takes a group effort. It takes, it, it's a challenge. It's, there's so much involved in, in going out and, and killing something and bringing it home to the tribe or village or whatever, feeding everyone. And I think that what we do, like we're genetically coded or it's in our DNA. You know, they talk about nature and nurture, like our conditioning, yours it would be, you know, the mountains is cause that's where you are. And that's what you love. Mine would be the ocean because that's what, what where I, where I grew up, where I was conditioned in. Um, but there's this challenge, there's this drive, there's this like code in us that we can't to take risks and to do this. And, and then I asked myself how I felt after. So it was really big three days, four days ago, five days ago here, the biggest swell of the year. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going, I'm going to go and I'm going to go out there and, see what happens and and one thing that i have taken away from the accident that i never totally was at peace with before the accident was expectations placing happiness in the in the future placing happiness and oh if i get this wave or if i nail that line or whatever in your world then then i'll be happy it was always it, it always it was like oh I, you know i always kind of like was thinking about that but i've lost a lot of that, I feel like, and I, I, I go out now, and I went out on that day a few, last week with zero expectations, just, just a, a real peace with it, but just so excited to be out in this like incredible event. Like it only happens a few. It was almost the best I've ever seen one of the waves out here in all my life, and it was huge and perfect, and 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 I felt this calm and and peace that I've never felt before. It was weird. Um, and I got a, ended up getting a beautiful wave and I, I came home that night and to my kids and wife and I was like just so overwhelmed with this, these feelings and, and I you know, just tried to sit back and just kind of look at or just sense the feelings that I had at that moment and there was, you know, there was this happiness, there was like this accomplishment and there was like there it was like almost it was almost overflowing and and i feel like that would be the same feeling like if you were you know for you know millions of years if we were hunting and we bring back a big you know buffalo or whatever it was and we bring it back to the tribe like there's a sense of accomplishment there's like there's adoration because that you feel there's all these things so so i don't no, like when people ask me, are you going to go back? It was like this, and, and is it selfish? I'm struggling with that. And that's, that's kind of where my head's at now because I, I, I had, I couldn't tell myself no. And like, I'm sure you struggle with this too. I'm sure you're feeling that same feeling on different levels. I don't know where your head's at, but I, that's why I wanted to talk to you. So can you reflect on a little bit of that? So. Yeah. <laughs> I love it, Cole. I mean, I, I love it, man. I, the way I find myself expressing it a lot these days is that um, 
I think earlier in my life, there was like this, I mean, the word you use, expectations, right? Like, I think expectations ruled my, my thinking about the mountains and my feeling of like being okay with myself and, and feeling like, yes, I, I'm, I'm living the life I should. I'm meeting my expectations. I'm advancing in all these ways. Last year, I skied the such and such, but this year I skied this, and this was bigger. And um, that, that became a very like intoxicating kind of way of engaging with the mountains that definitely helped me move forward. It definitely was something that pushed me. Um, but, you know, then I've had these various, you know, losses, just soul crushing, you know, drop to my knees, like losses, where it's just like I shut the door uh, and I, I'm just like, just really soul crushed. And that's been years of that for me, you know, years of, of losing really dear and special friends. And now I find myself absolutely back in the mountains and back in love with the mountains and obviously having chosen to make, continue to make that a part of my life. And the way I feel about it now is that it is so much more about this connection with nature. And um, that has been a very freeing way for me to re-engage with the mountains free from a lot of expectations of like, am, am I, should I operate at this level? Am I at this level? Should I back down to this level? And now I don't even think about that anymore. For me, it's more just like the immersion in the natural world. And, um, and ultimately I think as a human being, like that's what I'm seeking when I'm out there is, you know, what do the oceans and the mountains share in common is they are a wild place, right? They are a place where like you are not in control. Risk is inherent. Uncertainty is, is the only certainty. And going into that kind of a place, even if it's just simple, uh, even if the snow sucks, um, but just like reconnecting with my natural habitat, being in the mountains, using my body to solve the challenges of the terrain, like that's like the that's like the, the way of thinking that i really am approaching the mountains with now um and it's much easier for me to answer that question that people ask of course of like you know um will you go back and it's it's like yeah absolutely i'm going back because that's my home that's where i belong that's i think ultimately like where we all belong is um you know in the natural world that's that's what our bodies have been from an evolutionary point of view, right? That's what we are evolved to do, to walk, to hunt, to travel, to explore, to discover. Um, and I guess for me that a, a life devoid of being in a place where I feel like, whoa, I'm just, uh, I'm just a passer through here. Uh, this, isn't my, this isn't a place that's necessarily safe for me. This is a place where uh, I'm humbled that's just like, that's a place that I think is just always going to have a part in my life. And exactly how close to the edge, I think that just like continues. But my, my thing around that is I just try to tell myself that like I make no promises to anybody about my level of risk. If I wake up tomorrow and I feel like profoundly shaken and afraid of the mountains, I'm just going to come out and say it. I'm going to be like... I'm too scared. You know, I, I don't feel like going there. And I, I make no apologies for that. You know, I don't make any promises to anybody that I'm going to be, oh, but you're a mountain guide and you do this gnarly stuff. It's like maybe, maybe one day and maybe the next day I make a different choice, you know. Um, and I just, I, I want to always put it out there and encourage other people too to put it out there. Like you don't owe it to anybody to take risk, you know. You don't, you just, you don't owe it to anybody. Like do it because that's what is, feels like the right thing for you and, and what, you know, the, the choice that you're called to, but like, there's no obligation. Um, and, and in a sense for me, there's no commitment. So like, I just take risk day by day, you know, I might, I might end up processing it totally different in six months and feel like, you know what, I just want to ski mellow powder and just, you know, just back off. That's I. That that'd be all good with me, you know. That's kind of um, kind of one of my new models, day by day, <laughs> baby steps. Um, yeah, like t tying your identity to to something that's 
these expectations, it sounds like you're kind of in the same place as me, or like being able to disassociate like that from that, being able to disassociate your identity from having to do these things and just being content with what's right in front of you on a day by day basis and, and listening to your gut. Like that's like, I heard you say, like, I may not feel it one day. And I, when I was younger, I would listen to the other side, maybe listen to like, I wouldn't listen to my body, listen to the you know, gut feeling, right? Listen to your heart, like the, all that. Like that's so, it's so strong. And sometimes we overlook it uh, because we're thinking about too many other things. Our mind gets in the way. And, and I, you know, now I encourage people to just really find that stillness and, and, and connect with that and listen to that because that will guide you more than anything else, I think, you know, especially in a lot of these, like, Anytime you're feeling that, like really just take a pause and, and really listen. And I'm sure there's been times where you ignored it and, and everyone has and something's gone wrong and you're like, fuck. And, and, and you know, maybe you didn't listen and, or I don't know, that's, that's one of the, it's easier. I was talking to um, Jerry Lopez, you know who that is? For sure. sure. Um, so I'm like, yeah, man, I was talking to him after the thing. He's like, yeah, I was like, you know, I didn't really have, we were talking about a swell after I got hurt and like, it was really good. And I was, you know, I wasn't ready to go back and surf. And, and I'm like, I didn't really have any FOMO, you know, FOMO, whatever. Yeah, he's like, yeah. And he just laughs, he's all FOMO, you know, he gets it. Like, like at some point the fear of missing out, it, it's just so irrelevant because it doesn't matter. It, it's everything you have is right in front of you. And that's like this day by day thing is like, I guess I can really attest to this in a lot of ways because, and I think you can too, because we nearly, when you come that close to dying and then you get a second chance, it feels like you feel so blessed. And I don't know if it'll wear off one day or what, but I'm still kind of in this blissful state where Everything is a gift. I, my, my kids now, you know, they're two, and you have, they're just a little older, I think, but mine are two and four. And I look at them as my, um, my greatest teachers <laughs> or my, you know, my, my spiritual practice, teaching me things that every day, you know, just following them around is, is just, but then I, I, I feel like sometimes I can be totally content just with that. There's moments, but then there's this swell coming and I get like, or like for you, maybe like this incredible storm and then the, the conditions get good. Then there's the high pressure coming and you're like, you know, it's like that same feeling. And, and maybe it's all setting up for a certain zone you want to go to, or for us, a certain break and it builds. And then there's this like incredible feeling that, is like undeniable it just bubbles up and um maybe one day when i'm older i it will it won't bubble up as much <laughs> maybe but right now it's still there man. and 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 i and i and i and i acknowledge it but like like you said the nature that connection just being there and not setting expectations for yourself and just being out. Like whether you go out in the, you know, you go out on a backcountry trip or I go out on the ocean on the day, not having those expectations totally just changed it for me, I think in a lot of ways. And like you said, because yeah. Yeah, you, uh, you were talking a little bit about the idea of like identity. And I think for me, that has definitely been a, a trap that can make me want to do things that kind of quieten down that like intuitive listening to yourself is when I have felt like the world has expectations of me. Maybe my clients have expectations of me or just trying to, you know, live up to like this certain ideal of like what a person in my shoes should do. And, for me, having, you know, seen these things and, and survived these, these close calls, 
uh, and, and being a dad, it's much easier now for me to be like, no, I don't need that identity. I don't need that. Like, I don't, I'm not a skier. I'm not a guide. Like, I'm just me. You know, I just happen to like the mountains. I just, I'm, I, that's a place that makes me happy. That's a place that's, uh, I'm, I'm really, you know, um, charged by. But like, it doesn't need to be, I don't have to like attach myself to it and fulfill it. Like it's some destiny, you know, it's like, no. I mean, what I do is just the product of being a very privileged person and having the liberty to just go roam around the mountains for my living is just crazy. You know, in, in the world that we live in with, with what we see going on around us, like I would much rather feel like my identity is linked to just like being a good person and contributing in other ways. And the mountains are a place that I get refueled by for sure. And I continue to be really psyched on, but the more I can like let go of having an identity that I've got to fulfill, the more free I feel to just roll the way I, I want to. Anyway, I mean, I say that as if like, that's my ideal anyway, that's what I'm aiming for. I'm aiming to feel freer from expectations and just more able to just um, engage with nature because it's nature, because I, because it's wilderness and because I feel like it's a satisfying place as opposed to, um, yeah, a fulfillment of, of obligation or, or duty or identity or destiny and any of those things. Um, and I, I mean, yeah, you know, like in the film, I, I said uh, at one point that like surviving an accident um, that's where you come that close to dying and in your brain you've already died or or you've said your goodbyes you know and in my in my brain when when that accident happened I said my goodbyes you know I I had to like make my peace with going on to the next place and when that doesn't end up happening and you end up surviving um, it do, it's it's like whatever chains or like shackles you had before they're off you know and you are like you are a free man and that's how i feel like i don't feel much sense of obligation or or like that i have to do anything in the mountains you know i'm just like i feel freer and more able to just live the way i want to live and and um nothing yeah nothing to prove yeah, right, right. There you go. Yeah, nothing to nothing to prove or no attach not not so much a strong attachment to certain outcomes, you know, and um yeah, you know. I you have a um a spiritual practice or any um outlook on you wanna share? Any rituals you do before you go out in the mountains? Or? Yeah, I mean, not one that I could really like put a finger on, you know, but um, it's, it's, that's a hard one for me to, to even like define right now. But the answer is yes. <laughs> I just don't quite know. <laughs> well, it, sounds, it sounds like you're very spiritual, man. <laughs> yeah, same as me. Like right now, my, my kids are my spiritual practice. I'm just, I'm just like rolling, like, you know, I get. I get charged up on just being out in the nature and, and, and connecting and just slowing down, surfing slowly. <laughs> yeah. Pumping yeah. the brakes a little bit, but then letting it, let, opening it up when the opportunity presents, when I'm feeling it. And not yeah. having like, oh, I got to go here and I got to go fast. I'm just like, just see what happens. And that, that's like, to me, the biggest like, change you know just rolling with yes. like the day by day thing and, and, and not setting like you said not having a, uh, expectations and, and not not attaching to this identity creation that we have for ourselves so that we had in the past i mean to get where you are to get where you were you had to, you had to do certain things you had to i mean your people come to you because of your experience in the mountains and they trust you and that that trust is going and, and you may think, oh, well, you know, these guys, they want to do this line, but I'm not feeling it. They're going to trust you, and that's why they're going to you. And if they're not, and if they, and if they don't like it, then they can go somewhere else. 
And, yeah. and that's, that's kind of like the, um, I feel like we both age. I feel like we're, <laughs> as we age, we change. And this conversation would be totally different in five years, I'm sure. But yeah, um, yeah, like totally. maybe next month. But no. Yeah, one of one of my like strategies right now for like surviving the next chapter of my career because I'm like you, right? Like I have not exhausted my like hunger for the mountains, and when it's a beautiful bluebird sunny day and I look up at the high peaks, I'm like, whoa, you know, a hunger for that experience. I just I love being up there where it's all complicated and involved, and you got to really rely on your partners. Like I love that. Um, but one of, one of my like strategies that I'm trying to really hone right now is, is frequency, right? And just reducing the frequency of being out there. Whereas before it was like, it, unless the mountains were screaming no, then it was yes. And if, if there was something that, you know, um, was the obvious reason not to, to, to be in a certain place, then I would heed it. But now, I'm like, no, now just look for the perfect windows and enjoy them and and let that linger for longer. Let that satisfaction of having like been in a wild place, let it just linger for a while and you know, maybe you get a couple weeks out of it before you feel like you gotta for, be a dog for, the, for the, the, the next shot. <laughs> I kind of, I, you know, um like and then you just you're like you're showing up really like prepared for the moment and and really what just kind of, like so much appreciation. Like it's really something special. What kind of, um, you know, talking about risk mitigation, like, and, and that, I think a lot of it comes in with that mindset that you just said, just not having to just tackle line after line, but, but enjoying the, the one line or the two lines or whatever, and, and enjoying the, the mountains. Are there certain um, things that have changed in your career, um, technology-wise, or just you know, culturally-wise, that have um, that you guys use uh, to mitigate the risks, like the avalanche bags, or those those types of things. I guess, like, are there certain things that have changed, or has it been pretty much the same things? Was there one big breakthrough? I feel like you know, it, it no is my feeling. Ultimately, no, like, I don't think we are any safer than we were when I first started playing the game. Um, maybe we have deepened our understanding, maybe, but, you know, when you look at how people in the mountains are dying, it, it's in the winter and in, in this way that I roll, like, it's mostly still avalanches and it's largely very experienced people. Um, what is changing is certainly like the culture around it um, and the, the, how common it is. And there's so many people now um, who have the aptitude and the interest and the skills and the kit to go and, you know, play the big mountain game. And so there's a, there's a lot of increase in, in traffic for sure. And that is uh challenging of course because that, you, know, like scary. Surfing, you, you can only help that with edu educating them because you can't prevent them no so, yeah no and like if 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 we're going to talk about how enriching a life in the wilderness is then we should wish that for everybody else too and you know we should um we should create a culture that's welcoming because but you're you're in that business, right? You do avalanche training courses for groups and stuff, correct? Yeah, totally. So, so yeah. A, a newcomer could come to you and go, I want to sign up for one of your courses. Are you offering them now? Yeah. yeah, yeah. In fact, it's funny how parallel our programs are, right? Because um, you know, there's there's a lot of great avalanche education providers in in our field, um, and who do a great job. But what we want to do and the only um people that we really serve are those people who want to explore the wild terrain the big mountain terrain the complex terrain there's a lot of skiers out there who want to go and ski powder and have a nice day and get a little exercise and hang out with their friends and they're really well serviced by the existing avalanche education 
But for that person who isn't satisfied by that and who's always like hungering for that really high risk experience that is the, the high alpine, that's where, um, that's where we work. And that's the program that we provide. It's called the Big Mountain Snow Safety Course. And it's basically like me and partners of mine who, you know, we try to operate like an open book and we share like, this is our method, not as guides, but like, this is how we roll. This is how we actually do it. Um, these are the questions that we're asking. Th these are our, our strategies and, you know, hopefully um, equipping people who just have that hunger like I had in, in my 20s to be out there and, and, and make the call and, and travel through what's really a pretty dangerous environment. Yeah, when I, when I took the course you guys did for us in, in, Salt, or in Utah, were you in Utah, right? Yeah, that was, yeah. yep. The yeah, that out. was, um, I learned so much. Thank you again, that was amazing. You guys did a, an awesome job um, preparing. And, and what you're doing is you're educating to, so people can assess and, and, and be safer in the mountains, which is awesome, right? You're offering, you're offering an experience which will allow someone to enter that landscape but with a, a different mindset and hopefully with enough knowledge to, to make the right choices if something to prevent and if something bad happened. Um, kind of similar to what we do in, in the ocean with the brag stuff. Um, there was an incident, speaking on that, there was an incident um, on the big swell here last week on Saturday, uh -huh. um, that or Friday, whatever it was. But it was a big swell and, and there was uh, more jet skis than had ever been there. And a lot of the guys didn't have experience and a big set came, and I don't know if you saw this video, the thing went viral, but there's one jet ski like shooting up like 30 feet and 60 feet in the air. Did you see that? Anyway, well, I'll no. show it to you. But anyway, they're all running for this one wave and, and there's a certain technique. You can turn around and run in front of the wave or you can try and get over it. And in experience, like um, this guy just pinned it and just went flying up this wave and it could have landed on somebody and another ski went flying up it and then a photographer broke his back. He's in the hospital now or maybe wow. out but he had to get surgery and another guy broke his leg. It was, it was kind of mayhem and luckily there weren't more waves. But we did a, um, we invited the guys um, on the skis that drove the skis that, that people were talking about and invited some of the lifeguards and Brian Kiolano who does right, we did a debrief um, and we weren't, we weren't, we didn't come down on them. We just offered to educate them. And, 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 you know, we say there's no wrong choices because the choices have already been made. Like we just have to move on. Right. Yeah. Like, like these guys were super apologetic, super bummed. Mm -hmm. The guy that was driving the ski that the photographer broke his back on, he acknowledged he didn't have experience. He was super down. So I think mm -hmm. the debrief really helped him. Um, and we all, you know, gave him a hug and just told him, dude, just, we got to train more and come to us, use this as a resource. But, but we realized, sure, I'd like to tell everybody they can't be out there because it's like our special way of, you know, what they're doing. And it's not going to happen because we don't own the, the, that country. We don't own the ocean. So people are going to oh, be yeah. out there. So all we can do now moving forward is um, offer services to educate and um, prepare people so that they can be out there safely. And, and that, I'll send you that video, it was, it was pretty wild. But that just happened and, and that kind of speaks on what you're saying. Like, and it sounds like there's gonna be a big snow up in um, like 10 feet of snow in Tahoe or something crazy. So I mean, yeah. and, and there's probably not that great of a layer underneath and it's probably gonna be sure. dangerous and probably blah, blah, blah. So like that type of thing, like is, you know, that's scary, right? Like, in your world, you're probably looking at that going, oh boy, like, you know, stuff could definitely go down. Um, and yeah, like I was telling you earlier, I had a friend, like you said, the most experienced guys are the guys, a lot of, a lot of times the guys that get hurt or, or killed in, in, in the mountains. And um, I told you about a friend of mine that got buried in Whistler not too long ago, but they got him out and gave him CPR and yeah. brought him back and it's so scary. And, and, and seeing here in the ocean, like uh, speaking on the technological advances <laughs> in, in our world, in our sport, the, the biggest one in the, I think the 70s was the leash. 
And um, that had some resistance because it was like, oh, well, if you need to wear the leash, then you shouldn't be out here. You can't swim mm -hmm. in. But now everybody wears the leash. Then the next one was the foam impact vest. And I gave resist. I kind of like laughed at that too a little bit when they first started wearing them in the some Brazilian guys were wearing them back in the early 2000s. We're like, look at these guys. They look like muscle suits. They saved my life last year. Um, and then the last one was the, um, well, the jet ski was during this whole time too. It kind of came in in the late 90s, 2000s. And, and Brian Kailano, who works with us in Bragg, kind of brought that into the uh, lifeguards here. And it's kind of spread as like the number one safety, uh, water safety craft. Um, and training people how to properly use those. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of parallel to all these advancements. But the last one was this inflatable vest, which is similar to the, uh, the airbag. Uh, but like you said, you can't rely on any of those things. It comes down to, you know, listening to your gut and having the proper training and be able to, to deal with the water on your own. Because, you know, what if the leash breaks or what if the vest doesn't, gets blown off you, or what if there is no jet ski? So, you know, and then that the, it looks like in the mountains now, everyone was wearing helmets, whereas not too long ago they weren't, within the last 10 years, right? Or five years, on the ski mountains, the ski slopes. Yeah, no, and, and in the high peaks, for sure. Um, those, you know, the, beacon technology is certainly advanced and you know airbags have a role in some places um but i think when you look at it from like the thirty thousand foot view looking down at the big picture you see that ultimately like the keys to survival are being a good interpreter of nature right because snow looks like snow snow looks white and uh looks beautiful and you, as a skier, you have to be able to interpret what's below the surface, not just what's on the surface. And how what is happening below the surface also connects to the terrain. Um, and being able to, to just be a good interpreter of nature, that is ultimately what surviving avalanche terrain, in my opinion, is really all about. Um, you know, like in, in being an interpreter of nature is more than just having taken an avalanche class. It's also about like a mindset, you know, um, because when we come into the mountains, just like charging and we're very focused on objectives and we want to ski the such and such. And, you know, we like treat the mountains as a commodity, you know, and I, I think I've definitely been in that mind frame many a time. But now, again, like looking at it from what I call like the other side of the curtain where I stand now, it's like when I look at my accidents and, and things that I've seen go wrong, I see how the clutter of expectations and perhaps what's going on in life can obliterate just being able to observe nature and to make interpretations of nature and then understand stability from there and that really requires a very like engaged and quiet state of mind and a very good connection with your partners because no mountain guide no avalanche professional nobody can truly know what happens below the surface of the snow it will always be a mystery and the best way to survive a long life in the mountains i think is to to have that that mind frame I was talking about of, of being an interpreter and being open, you know, and, and, um, and drawing out other people in the group and trying to get that perspective that reflects more than just my vision of what's going on. But like, how does, how does Joanne see it over here? And how does Peter see it over there? And like, what have you observed? And what do you feel? And really just when you come in with that mentality, that's like, none of this is certain, none of this is given. But if we are really listening, if we're really tuned in, perhaps we'll have a good enough understanding that we can travel safely through this terrain. Um, and I think, you know, early in your career, as you make these choices and 
you step into bigger terrain and you accomplish bigger things, you have these successes and people around you start to see you as a leader, your confidence, it just rages, you know? And the more success you have, the more it rages. And that's a really fun time in your life because everything is just coming together and you're nailing it and you're crushing and you got the photos to prove it and it's dope. It's like, wow, this is insane. And then everything goes wrong, you know, and someone dies or you take the ride on the carpet and then you, you just get so humbled, you get so crushed. And then coming back from there, you can regain, you know, uh, a, a way forward, but you'll never, in my experience, you'll never ever have that same confidence. And that confidence that you get in that early part of your career when everything is just jamming along is very magical, is very powerful, and it can enable some wild things that can be really fun. But it's not usually very sustainable, at least not if you're wired like I was, you know, uh, and like many of the people around me were. Um, and it's funny now, you know, having played the game for two, 20 years, I have so much less confidence now than I did 10 years ago. You know, um, when you talk about confidence, are you talking about um, your decisions in the mountains? Yeah. Like, I yeah. would, I would go across this area, but now I wouldn't. The same, like, like twenty years or ten, like, like those types of decisions you're saying to get to a line or do a line. I would go down this space, but you're talking about the uncertainty of whether it will slide or not. That type yeah. of decision. Yeah, totally. Just like the feeling that, you know, there, were, there can come a time in your career if, if things are just like going great where you can get into really complicated terrain and you could be like, I got it. I know it. I got it. It's figured out. Let's go, you know. And that type of confidence is what I'm talking about that like now – when I see when I'm with someone who has that kind of confidence, I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. That scares me. Because I've been there. I've had that confidence at one point in my life. And I've gotten smacked down and I've seen my friends get smacked down and I've taken the ride and I've lost friends. And it's like I'll never again have that confidence. It's never coming back. And that's okay. I'm good with that. You know, I'm good with now I'm much more like, hmm, let me think about it for a minute. I don't know, Cole, what do you think? You know, um, and that's really what I want to cultivate. And um, you went from a, a risk a risk taker to a risk technician. <laughs> yeah, that's what we say. That's what we say. That's what we say. Yeah. Right? No, but I, I kind of I, I I see what you're saying on the confidence, and I think a lot of that comes from as we're younger, ego plays a lot into that because of the the rewards we get and the adoration and these lines and this personal challenge and all these things, but at the same time, there's going to be a day, there's going to be a moment that you just know it's right because all that experience that you talked about is compounded and you've transcended that identity you were before, but you still retain all the mountain knowledge. So pushing away that, that word confidence, there may be a situation that is exactly the same or even different, but even gnarly or whatever, that you will just flow into because your mind, body, and nature, everything tells you to. And that doesn't require the confidence. That's just your, your collective experience. And I, and I feel like you can call it whatever you want, but that's going to happen to you. You're going to be in a position where it just flows. And you'll just, I mean, you won't even know it. You'll just, you'll flow. and this is what happened to me the other day. I was sitting out there and the conditions were, they're massive, but I felt this like, peace and calm like I was supposed to be there and maybe before I would have called it confidence but now I just accepted it and I just it was just like oh I'm just here if it's the right way to come I'm gonna catch it and it, would, it was just this totally different feeling and it and but I had you know I, I had prepared mentally I had I had I had put a safety ski in the channel I had my safety vest on I had a this um this soft kind of helmet that um um, with that high impact, that foam that hardens on impact that they put in motorcycle suits. 
huh. that I put in this like hoodie. Huh. So if I were to hit my head on the reefer board, it wouldn't. Um, I, 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 I've worn a helmet since the accident, but I had a, mm. a wipeout and it kind of tweaked my neck super hard. So this mm. this other slimmer thing mm. kind of works. I, um, but anyway, I had all this and I, I slept well the night before. You know, the night before big days, you kind of like sleeps a little, you know, the deal, the preparation. Like you said, the whole thing, it's not just the line. It's not just the wave, it's, it's the build up too. The excitement, the challenge, all of this. And that confidence, yeah, you talk about it like you'll never be there again, but you're still going to be in the mountains and you're still going to go do something that's for you. In, you know, it's going to be this incredible experience, but it's, it's relative to everyone else's experiences too. And it may, it's going to be amazing. So I, I like where your head's at, but I don't want you to under, I don't want you to believe that you're, your, I think confidence is almost the, I know where, you're, where we're going with that, but you're still there because of all the experience and all the things that you've done, you're already in a position where the, you're in a different position. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, there's a flip side to the coin, right? Because you can't operate in a high risk environment without confidence. Right, like you can question and you can doubt, but then when it comes time to go, you gotta go, you know. And when you commit, you have to commit because your body has to be your friend, it has to be collaborating with you and moving with you so that you can do this challenging thing as best as you know how. And, and your mind, you, you're gonna, you're gonna leave your, your, your thoughts and your mind's gonna just move over here and everything's yeah. just gonna flow. Yeah, and that's going to come back to you. You can talk all you want about it now, about not having the confidence, but when you're in that Zen moment, when you're in that moment on the mountains, and when you're feeling it, it's just, you're just going. You're just going to go again. And it's going to be that same you that you were, but it's going to be different because everything is screaming go inside of you, and you're not thinking about it. Um, and, but I know what you're saying. Like Our thoughts can be our worst enemies often. And now that we had these accidents, we go, oh, well, you know, we keep going back to that. But that's something we just deal with. And it will change. Like we said, it could be different in a year or two years. But Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm really just now um, getting back into the mountains. And, and for us, our, our like big mountain season is still yet to come mostly. I mean, there are little windows in a time like January, but really – things become simpler and more reliable as the season wears on. And, you know, I, I haven't really gotten there yet. So I haven't really been in that, in that environment where it's like really high consequence and, and really complicated. Um, I'm, a yeah, little so. ahead of, I'm, a, I'm a little ahead of you. And I'll yeah, exactly. It feels good. Are you, I'm sure in the back of your mind, are you thinking about going back one day to that, the same line? I know this is a tough question, but like the same line you got in an avalanche on? Does that like cross your mind? Like I need to go back there one day? Yeah, you know, I mean, I kind of think it might not even be that big a deal because the terrain, you know, is serious, but it was the conditions in that moment that took me down. Um, so I think like if I had fallen, say, and just taken a spill and tomahawked down a line, that would be a bigger barrier for me to feel like, okay, I've got to go make peace with that and go back there again. Um, I don't think that repeating that line would be like a huge mountain to climb, you know? So if someone told you you could never do that line again, you'd be totally okay with it. Yeah, I think I could go either way on that. You know, I think for me, it's just like getting back into that really high consequence type of environment, whether it's at a home here in the Tetons or halfway around the world. It, when you get into that place where you're like, oh boy, this is game on and I have to nail this. It has to be perfect. Because if I get avalanched here or if I fall here, it's game over. Those situations, I haven't gone back there yet. Um, but you want to so, go back to them. But you'd like to go back to them. Yeah, I would. <laughs> yeah, here we are again. I like it there. It's, you know? it's genetic. I, yeah, I, I love it there. The, I mean, I do, no question. Um, 
um, every time it goes blue in the mountains and I look up and I see all this, you know, gnarly complex thing, I'm like, yeah, I want to do this and then that and link it all together. Like, yeah, that hunger hasn't really subsided. Um, maybe it will, you know, or, or, or probably, probably it won't. But um, what I'm hoping is that I can find a balance where I still get have those experiences but i just don't need to like do them every day all the time just go 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 you know um enjoying the mo the moments like you said rather than like full speed like just slowing yeah. it down a little yeah yeah you know um I'm, maybe you have this too you mentioned jerry like for you maybe that you know that's like a mentor but for me there are certain people who i feel like have navigated these types of moments in their career and found a way forward and for me that like jeremy jones has really like helped me a lot with that i always look to jeremy because you know here's a guy who like made his career writing the gnarliest things uh, the whole world knows jeremy jones and everybody has expectations of what like jeremy's gonna do and how big he's gonna go and you know from the himalayas to like jumping out of helicopters like all the gnarliest things you know, and, and here's a guy like you go riding with Jeremy and he is never happier than right now, right here, just doing my thing. You and me like hanging with my kids, shredding with my friends. And you, he's just like a, a guy who's really found peace with like being in this new chapter. And he, you know, he'll still say like, oh, yeah, like when it all comes together and, and you can really go big, it's super sweet. But he's not like chomping and chewing his arm off trying to get there. He's just like very at peace with where he's at. And so I'm just like trying to, I'm trying to channel, channel Jeremy, you know, I just I feel like <laughs> as a dad and, you know, yeah, he's, know, he, he's kind of like a, uh, somebody I really look up to in that way. And I'm like, okay, yeah, like there, he's clearly at peace with this whole thing, you know, um, and he'll, he'll seize the moment when it's there. And when it's not there, he'll find joy and like, you know, protect our winters and hanging with my children and, you know, riding at the resort and whatever, you know. Uh, yeah, we, we have some, he, yeah, he's, he's, he's incredible. I did a trip with him to Iceland, and him and Forrest and Brian and Gucci. Okay, yeah. We went on the Aurora Arctica, this boat to the Northwest Fjords. And, Epic. And like you said, man, he was just, just so stoked, like a little kid all day, every day. I yeah. love that. It's like your kids, like looking at that same passion and fire and your kids when they get a new toy or whatever it may be, you know, it's like, it's the same thing and being able to carry that stoke with you as you get older and not let all these negative things come into your life. And especially now with like everything that's, you know, the world, like everything it's it's, it's nice to have this outlet, the mountains and the ocean and, and be able to enjoy it. And I think everybody that, should be able to enjoy it. I can, and, and it's incredible that you offer these these types of um, classes and educational programs to to offer people, you know, experience. Uh, it's really neat, man. Yeah, th thank you, Cole. Th thanks so much. I mean, um, yeah, it's uh, you're absolutely right. It's a total privilege to 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 have you know a life that's built around being out there. And to me, one of the most satisfying things right now is is like connecting with that next generation of riders and being like well i don't have it all figured out but this is what i this is my method this is how i roll like this is my thought process and here you go you know i can share it freely and you'll make of it what you make of it and you'll evolve it and you know in 10 years from now maybe i'll come take the course from you um but here it is and um that's sh sharing your knowledge, man, because it sounds like you have um, a wealth of it. And, and I took your course. It was incredible. So people, people are recite, man, to take it. I'll, I'll, I'd like, and if you come out here to Hawaii, maybe we'll um, get you out here and you can do one of our um, ocean courses. Man, that'd be amazing. I have a huge hunger for the ocean, and I've never really <laughs> sunk my teeth into that. But um, it's, it's, a, it's the same the thing. It, it's just all melted. The snow just melted. <laughs> <laughs> just melt this snow. I I I feel it, man. It's it's another powerful you, you medium. You just keep right? following it down the hill. You'll end up here. <laughs> <laughs> That's about right. Um, well, Cole, it's it's been an hour and it's been a great hour. Um, yeah. I've really enjoyed it, man. And um, thank you so much. 
uh, lending your voice to, to this conversation. Really kind of a, a special thing. Yeah, brother, right on. Uh, and like uh, Neil Armstrong said, there can be no great accomplishment without risk. Yeah. yeah. And you know what? Like, but we mitigate the risk and we do our things. And like, you know, he said that. I was just kind of reading something the other day when he, about him and everything. Oh, here's Hakea. Hakea, come say hi to Uncle. Come. <laughs> come. Come say hi. <laughs> All right. There we go. This is, uh, this is the two year old. She just turned two yesterday. What's her name? <laughs> say hi. Yeah, that's Uncle Z. Um, but yeah, man, I really appreciate what you do and thanks for connecting. And I just honestly just want to talk about initially your film was epic and the whole selfish thing. Like when you mentioned that, I was like struggling with that, you know, and like this makes me feel better. I think, um, you know, we just educate, we share and we just keep going and listen to our hearts, man. Day by day, rather than come yeah. visit, come to Hawaii. I'm going to take you up on that call. Yeah. And thanks to all of you guys for um, all your comments and, and kind words and just uh, cheering us on and being here. It's been a super cool experience. So peace to everybody out there. Yeah. See you guys. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha.